I'm looking forward to this, this discussion about the Highlands and Islands Climate Change Community Grants with UKRI, Bristol Science Association, and us supporting with, as Science Kayleigh. Uh, my name is Lewis, um, and just to set the kind of space and the tone of what we are hoping to do uh, for the webinar, um, of course, we want this to be a respectful space. Uh, we will use mute as the default. We've got quite a lot of diff different uh, speakers coming in, and we do have um, interpreters as well. Um, there are, um, and do look after yourself. We've got a break um, just about in the middle of the section. But obviously, if you want to step away, that's absolutely fine. And as you'll see in the later comments, it is being recorded as well. So you won't miss anything if, you, if life happens and you need to step away from uh, the screen uh, or the webinar. Um, we do have two interpreters do, um, with us at the moment, which is great. Um, and if you would need the BSL interpretation, uh, you can pin them into the chat, uh, into, it's into your view. And we also have live captions that are available at the moment as well. Um, and we have that, and you can turn that on or off if you find that useful. If you have any questions at any time, do let us know in the chat. Uh, we're also going to be using a little a different tool called Padlet a little bit later, um, and that's going to be helpful just so we can gather this and, and share some of the discussions and you can upvote, downvote, and it's anonymous as well, which is useful. But of course, if there's any technical issues, let us know as we go forward. We have It is a shared space, so we're mostly going to be using written discussion tools today. Uh, again, we've got a lot to fit into the discussion. Um, but if we don't get through all the questions, please, we, we will follow up. We are, will be able to answer any further questions, especially those on the Padlet, or you can also get our contact details as well. And finally, just to highlight again that we are recording this webinar. It means that you can watch this uh, pass. You can share this with colleagues or those who couldn't join us live today as well. Um, so if there are options for sharing things anonymously, if you'd like to, uh, but just being aware that this is going to be shared online as well. Brilliant. And then quickly to set the scene about what we're doing for the webinar. So we are in the welcome at the moment. Um, we're going to give a very short overview of the grant just to kind of get the kind of key uh, information about the grants. Um, and then we have two panels um, with the first one being setting the context of, of the grants and what's happening around climate change um, in the Highlands and Islands, and also um, thinking about how this grant is positioned in terms of from UKRI's, the funders perspective, and from the British Science Association. We're then going to focus a little bit more about the detail of the grants, what questions we're asking for in the application form, um, and uh, some of the kind of key information that you might need to know, in particularly around how communities uh, and researchers could work together and what we'd like to see um, in, in these types of projects, what excites us. At three o'clock, there's an opportunity for a breakout discussion. Um, you'll get to meet some other colleagues, people on this call, if you would like to. Um, and then we'll do some reflection again using um, that kind of shared document, the Padlet, uh, just to kind of get a bit of an idea of what people might be interested in doing, what people might need support with, and what questions might be helpful to answer. We then have our second panel, uh, which has community members and researchers uh, from uh, different parts um, of Scotland and beyond about focusing on the question around how can communities and researchers work together and trying to give some real world examples of what that might actually look like. And then finally, the last 20 minutes are reserved for question and answers. So we'll pick up uh, any question and answers that you might have. Um, that'll be a chance for some of you to unmute if you've got a question uh, and we'll highlight what the next steps are before we round up at four o'clock for the webinar end. So hopefully that gives you a bit of a context for today. Next, I'm going to introduce um, the British Science Association team. Um, in particular, we have Kate Orchard, uh, who is Head of Community Engagement, and Dr. Christina fuentes Tivit, who is the Community Engagement Manager, to give a bit of an overview of what the grant is. And this is kind of a, just to give you the kind of key information that you need, and hopefully answer some of those immediate questions about what this is, how much, and who it is for. So Kate and Christina, are you there? Yes. Nice to see so many people online, it's great. So yes, um, very brief, briefly, uh, this is a key part of our work at the British Science Association, really just looking at making science much more relevant and represented and connected to society and communities. 
So we know, and we're really keen to share with um, organisations and community groups like um, yourselves and people who are hoping to apply to this grant, that it, science is much more than a body of research or people working in a lab. So all the stereotypes, and actually it can be a way of asking questions, making decisions and understanding the world, as we all know. But also, I think really key is about, we want to, we are interested in how um, we make science and research really relevant and and making it more accessible to much. I might jump in, Kate. Um, I'm not sure if you can, it looks like we've lost Kate. So I'm just gonna jump in. Hi, everybody. <laughs> um, so yeah, following on from uh, Kate's introduction to the BSA's vision and sort of mission, um, specifically looking at this grant. So uh, this is a small grant that we uh, are hoping to support the Highlands and Islands communities with. We want to help the communities connect with researchers and lead local projects that will adapt and respond to climate change issues that are really relevant to these local communities. So we want via this scheme to spark conversations, build relationships and try new things around climate action, as well as explore how local lived expertise can be valued alongside academic expertise. Okay, so we'll start off right away with some key figures and dates. So amount of money um, where uh, the grants will support up to 4,500 pounds. Um, they're for community projects that will last up to six months running from April to October of 2022. The deadline for applications is the 31st of January. So that's Monday at 5 p.m. And projects will be notified by mid-February of whether or not they're successful. And then researcher matching and the wider setup if required um, support for that process will be happening in March. And finally, we're hoping to support roughly 10 projects across the Highlands and Islands, and we want this portfolio to be really diverse in terms of the types of projects that we're supporting, the climate change topics that are being addressed, as well as the locations and groups that are involved. So for the grants themselves, um, they are for applications must come from a representative from a community group and the groups must be community based. And the, for the British Science Association, uh, the community group is defined as any group of individuals sharing experiences, character, characteristics, interests or needs. Um, the community does not need to be a formal group or organization and the application can be made by an individual on behalf of that group. And in terms of the definition from a place-based approach, which Highlands Lines are defined for this grant um, as the following areas. So Highland, Murray, Korean and Eland Shear, or Western Isles, Orkney Islands, Shetland Islands, and Argyll and Butte Councils, and the Isles of Arran and the Isle of Cumbrae. And who is it for? So the project is, is, needs to involve working collaboratively with, with the researcher, um, but you do not need to be matched with the researcher. Part of the process um, is, is involves matching with the researcher later down the line. And we do welcome applications led by groups where this might be the first time you've worked with the researcher um, and or this might be your, your first foray into working on climate change. And we'll also be prioritizing applications working with groups who are traditionally underrepresented in science, research and innovation, which could include people living in rural locations, people from ethnic minority backgrounds or speakers of minoritized languages, people from a lower socioeconomic background, including those disadvantaged in terms of education and outcome, and people with additional support needs, a physical or mental condition or impairment. Classic, muted myself, sorry. <laughs> so um, just to give you some ideas of projects and activities that could be linked to our theme of climate change. So some of your projects could involve how we grow and eat food, how we travel sustainably, how we source and use sustainable power, how and where we live in the future, how we manage waste and consumption, and how we protect our natural environment and biodiversity. Um, and just to, to make really clear, these are just suggestions and we welcome other topics around climate change that you might have.
Okay, so what support is available? And we really want to emphasize one of the take homes from the webinar is that you know we've got support for you throughout the whole process, especially if um, you're a, an individual or, an, or a group that's never applied for this type of funding before. So we're here to support you through the application process, as well as matching you with a researcher if that's something that um, needs to be done. Um, and we also are gonna offer bespoke support throughout the project. And we'll be developing a community of practice through the supported projects. So some of the things to highlight, this webinar is being recorded, as Lewis has said, um, and all of the links that we're sharing will be available after as well. We have a detailed guidance document and an FAQ document on our website. Uh, the application form is live right now, um, and you are able to save your progress as you go along, so you don't have to do everything in one go. We also on our website have a PDF that contains all of the questions that are on the application form if you wanna have a look at that before you start your application. And you're also welcome to get in touch with us directly. Um, so uh, the email address there for myself or anyone from the BSA's community engagement team is listed there, and so is Lewis's email address. Classic, also muted. <laughs> Thanks very much, Christina. Um, and that brings us, hopefully gives you the kind of wider context of the grant. And we wanted to contextualize that with some of the work that's going on across the Highlands and Islands around climate activity already. We recognize there's a lot of work going on. There's a lot of innovation in communities that are leading with researchers as well. Um, and we wanted to kind of bring context to that and also bring in the BSA and UKRI, UK Research and Innovation, to contextualize why this grant at this time. But first, I'm going to introduce Joan Lottie, who is from North Highlands and Islands Climate Hub, um, hosted by Furza Community Development Trust and also uh, Highland Adapts, as well as John Matteo Gono uh, from Scottish Communities Climate Action Network um, SCAN. So I'm going to stop sharing. Hopefully, um, you're all here. Fantastic. Welcome so much, folks. Um, I'm just going to quickly ask anyone who's um, not speaking, if you won't mind turning off your cameras, that's just for this bit, um, and John Mathieu, and we have Joe, there we go. <laughs> Could you briefly introduce yourself and maybe tell us very briefly from your perspective, what does a community-led community, um, community -led climate action mean to you individually? And we'll start off with uh, John Mathieu, if that's all right. Lewis, thanks very much for having me. <clears throat> Well, I think the uh, the power of a network is, uh, is to kind of uh, each member of the network can uh, can come together and and, uh, and and share the knowledge and and expertise so that a uh, newer member or people who are starting activity uh, that they may not be familiar with they might um, basically uh, they they might not have to reinvent the wheel. So I think um, all parts of society effectively need to kind of take climate action. So um, community-led has got a huge part in, in the not only um, taking climate action uh, with all the social ripple effect that goes with uh, an individual or family or, or a community taking climate action, but also to um, collectively ask for more change at the uh, leadership and political level. Um, so I think it's, it's key because, uh, you know, we need more of this uh, bottom-up approach um, and uh, and the Scottish government by funding uh, those uh, not only at, at scan in the in the kind of region investing in regional networks but also in the um, community climate hubs that we're going to hear from uh, from Joan they are demonstrating that they are they're recognizing the power of the bottom up approach um, and and that's that's what we need more of I believe. Thanks so much, Amitya. Um And maybe very briefly, just for those who might not know, what does Scan do? Um, I love your name, the Network Weaver, as a job title. Yes, thank you. Um, so we're the Scottish Communities Climate Action Network. So we're a, a network of uh, community organisations taking action on climate change all across Scotland. So we've got uh, also a number of members on the um, on the kind of uh, highlands and islands. Um, you, can, you can actually see all, all our members on the members directory here. Um, so it's, it's a useful map where you can see uh, who is doing what, and you can click on the links and go to their website. So uh, effectively, we're kind of um, uh, connecting groups together uh, for that purpose uh, of uh, kind of networking, learning from each other, as well as <clears throat> potentially creating synergies and, and, and new projects and uh, new connections. And uh, recently, we've 
we've received funding from the Scottish government to invest in regional networks. I don't know if you want me to speak about that now or later on. We'll, we'll pick up on that a little bit later, I think, sure. John Matthew. Um, lead and wanting more, as they say, um, which allows me to introduce Joan. Joan, do you mind introducing yourself, telling the many hats that you wear um, and what does community-led climate action mean to you? So, yeah, many, many hats, Lewis. Um, I am the development manager for Thursday Community Development Trust. Um, I think seeing some of the names on the call, that's where I'll be more recognised as being. Um, but I'm also the project manager for the North Highlands and Islands Climate um, Hub, which John Matthew touched on slightly as well, but and we'll come back to, to um, speaking more about the role of the hub. Um, so, and I'm also a project board member of Highland Adapts as well, which I'll be speaking a little bit later about. Um, I think for me, the role of sort of community-led climate action is that it is that ground up approach. It's localized solutions to global needs really. Um, and taking that place-based approach. Um, from the perspective of my hat as Thursal Community Development Trust, we take very much a, a place-based and an evidence-based approach. Um, and it's one of the reasons why, why we're now operating that hub is um, because of the levels of engagement that we've been able to do across the Thursal community. Um, one of my key interests as well is how we can, through climate action projects, um, actually solve some of the issues that we have that are existing in our communities. So fuel and food poverty um, being one of the main ones. I think that climate action projects actually have uh, a, a, a huge role to play in making a more equitable um, place across communities and taking that place-based approach to them. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Joan. Um, really interesting context, particularly in the aftermath of, of, of COP26, perhaps, and, and in terms of what next and, and that, that, that need to go from the bottom. And I think that's something that the grant really takes very seriously of, you know, very often in these types of projects between researchers and communities, it's the communities, it's the researchers generally get the funding and, and the researchers generally find, get the, you know, they find the community to make something happen. And I think we we'll really, really want to highlight the opposite from that. Uh, and ask how do you, what happens if we support communities to take the lead in these types of partnerships? Which brings me back, maybe back to John Mathieu to talk a little bit more about, well, what is that wider work? What is, it's in the name, um, how, uh, what is the wider work happening across Scotland uh, from SCAN members or otherwise um, around climate action and, and maybe tell us a little bit more about these regional hubs as well. Yes, so, I mean, although we, we do welcome both uh, individual members and group members, uh, the, the, I mean, SCAN was set up uh, as a result of uh, kind of Climate Change Fund project coming to an end back in 2011, and uh, different groups said, uh, you know, funding is is drying up, but we still want to carry on our activities. So how yeah. do we do that? And that was supported. Uh, that was created as a as a network structure to um well to try to address this issue and 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 uh, motivate each other, encourage each other to to carry on in some way, shape, or form. And I think there is a great uh, strength in having a, a networks. We're a national network, of course, but our vision from the start has been to um, uh, be a network of regional networks, whereas, where, as Joanne said, there's incredible uh, strength and, and usefulness is having a place-based place -based approaches and, and, um, and local solutions. So um, five CAN, five Communities Climate Action Network was, was set up and uh, they got some funding to have a coordinator they had to kind of get the network uh, growing. And uh, and so with um, now a Thurso Community Development Trust as well as Aberdeen Climate Action. So those were two pathfinders for the community climate action hubs. Um, so those, those two are again, uh, kind of they are trying to uh, be model of what could be uh, hubs and, and hopefully we can learn from, from, from their, their learnings. But um, I think uh, the network approach is is um, is definitely what what uh, what is needed for the future, because um, you know the, the communities and the people living there will know what's best for them and how to uh, get to there. This morning, I was actually on a call with uh, new members who signed up to to scan, and there was a gentleman from um, I can't remember which island, but he said he had published in two thousand and five uh, an approach to becoming a, a net zero island, uh, which is not published online, unfortunately. Back in the day, it was way in advance of the time where we're talking about net zero. And, um, and, and he said, you know, all, 
all, all that uh, kind of expertise came from from you know consulting local communities and um, and so although uh, each community has got their particularity, uh, there are also so many similarities in how to engage uh, with the community, how to communicate climate change, uh, how to deal with your local authority to um, work on their uh, climate emergency plan, and that's where you know the network brings people together uh, and and um, and you know encourage people to to learn from each other and um, yeah I think that's that's the strength of of a network and that's what we attempt to do at, at SCAN uh, via doing you kind know, of networking event uh, having speakers uh, um, and doing workshop training workshop we also run the community learning exchange where a community can apply to that small pot of funding and then kind of uh, share their skills and expertise with the rest of the membership. So that's what we're doing in a nutshell. Thanks so much, Joachim. Um, really interesting. Um, and I think that there's something there about how we're hoping for the, the projects, the 10 or so that we're hoping to support to kind of build a mini community of practice to make sure, you know, we're building our stakeholder network at the moment to make sure we are linked in with these networks and the one that Joan will talk about as well, I'm sure, to make sure that there is you know as you say there are these things linked up climate change is such a systemic issue that i think we need to make sure that we're not reinventing we are going from the bottom up and we are connecting so these projects are literally sustainable not just climate wise but also from a kind of they're not isolated and that we can give them the best opportunities to, to develop something further after these kind of this relationship building or this pilot or this experimental phase uh, to do this climate action so, Joan, could you tell us a little bit more about what's happening in the Highlands Line specifically then? Tell us what's happening with the Climate Hub. So, we are the North Highlands and Islands Climate Hub. And as Jean Mathieu has, has, has kind of said, is that so we're a pathfinder project for the Scottish Government. Um, really as a kind of reflection of that, just as SCAN have been doing <clears throat> and that SCAN do incredibly well. Um, is setting up these kind of regional networks and these regional hubs where um, climate action projects have found, I mean, many projects in the third sector, we find that you, you can get funding for a little bit of space of time and then it dries up. And how can we get more diversification into funding? Um, how can we support groups further? Quite often, a lot of projects um, are taken on by really volunteers who who want to do something good in their community, but there is a huge amount of bureaucracy involved in running a, a project and then employing staff and doing all of those things and then trying to make sure that your project stays there. So that's one of the remits of the hub is that we're there to, to help with all of that bureaucracy, to be able to help groups to design, deliver, develop projects. Um, right from the process of community engagement through to through to then delivering the project and making sure that they can secure funding um, further on or that they can embed some kind of enterprise within their projects to keep them going. Um, and also really establishing those networks and that best practice. Um, we've come from a perspective of, and I think it's one of the reasons that um, Thursday Community Development Trust is running the hub is we're only three years old as, as a development trust. Um, but we've been able to do a huge amount of projects in a very short space of time and get quite a lot of things on the go. Um, but that's really come from learning and um, from my perspective, probably devouring what other communities are doing. Um, so I found it really helpful being a member of SCAN and then being able to, to network. And actually the pandemic has probably allowed us in Highland where we're you know, it's, it's quite difficult to be able to go to a meeting in Inverness, um, but has been able to allow us to, to form these networks better. And so um, the, the process where the hub is at the moment, we're really looking at a mapping exercise of who all is in existence across Highland and the Northern Isles. Um, although we're calling ourselves tentatively the North Highlands and Islands Climate Hub, um, we won't turn away anybody who's not in North Highland. So you can be anywhere within Highland and can access help and support and um, signposting. A lot of signposting, it's quite a confusing landscape. There's a lot of agencies, organizations, networks that are working within the climate realm. So helping to try to bring all of that together and cut through that confusion and really get people talking to each other. That's, that's one of the main remits of it and networking and learning from each other. Brent, thanks so much, Joan. I think that's it's going to be a really 
important that I'm really glad that you're here and, and, and we're connecting in with each other to make sure that there, there is that. And we absolutely take, you know, these are small grants. Hopefully that's an opportunity to try something different. And we are really trying to focus on groups who might not have worked with climate change before. This might be their first opportunity to do that, but hopefully making sure there are pathways um, to build on this moving forward. Um, and I think that kind of, and I, I, I do want to quickly highlight some of the, the conversations and work we've had with other stakeholders from Highland Council, for example, they've got really active uh, activities uh, in terms of in trying to bring people together, conversations with the Highland Climate Conference, for example, uh, the work that Highland Islands Enterprise and UHI are doing as well. And so there's lots of work going on there and we're, we're trying our best to make sure that we can connect in with all these different things uh, from the researcher side as much as the community, third sector, the grassroots elements as well. So that kind of hopefully sets a bit of the scene. If you do have any questions, uh, for John Matteo, Joan, you can throw them into the chat and we'll come to them as well. Uh, but I also want to um, kind of, I suppose, contextualize the grant. Why now and, and why in this format? And so I want to invite Steve, uh, Dr. Steve Scott, who's the public engagement lead from UKRI or the UK Research and Innovation. Um, to join us and Kate Orchard to return from the British Science Association as well, just to kind of give a little bit of context uh, to this. Um, hello, Steve, welcome. Hi, good afternoon, good to be here. Great, so I mean, clearly from this conversation and otherwise, we, you know, we know there's lots of activity and interest in climate change and there's obviously lots of people in the webinar. Um, so from UKRI's perspective, what is motivating this particular grant? Why Highlands and Islands and why at this moment? Well, I think, you know, UK RI, we fund research innovation across the UK. Um, so we're one of the largest funders of research innovation and that's research innovation in all its forms. So that's science, arts, humanities, um, uh, you know, so you know, it's a really broad um, amount of research that we fund, but we're particularly, with COP26, you know, climate change is now really high on the agenda. It always was, but COP26 has really brought that to the fore. So, um, you know, it's, it's clear that there's lots of issues around climate change and there's particular issues of concern to specific communities, you know, how it might affect them, how they might have to adapt to it locally. So we really wanted to be able to use this call, working with the British Science Association to kind of explore that in a bit more detail. And we particularly wanted to work with communities in Scotland because of the COP26 link and it being in Glasgow. Um, but we really wanted to work with communities who maybe have fewer opportunities to explore research innovation uh, and really wanted to kind of hand over the, uh, the driving seat to them so they could drive the discussions, drive the agenda. Um, so we're kind of really looking forward to seeing through this grant how um, the people of the Highlands and Islands, you know, want to be involved and engage their communities with climate change research, um, you know, whether that's through the sciences um, or whether that's through social science or, or other subjects. Thanks so much, Steve. And a good reminder that it's not all about the hard sciences at all. It is the, the broader sense of research and innovation, which is really important. Um, Kate, I see you're nodding away. So from the British Science Association's perspective, why this approach to the, the climate uh, grant perhaps? Yeah, I think as Steve was saying, this is really about how we can support communities to have a real voice in shaping research and also share the learning by working together to tackle climate change. So um, it's very much about communities first coming up with the issues they want to address around climate change and what matters to them. And then us, you may have research already, but then us working to help you work with the researcher. And we'll talk a bit about that in a minute. And then I think sort of very quickly, I think we especially want to reach people in groups who might not normally have the opportunity or resource to connect with research. And also um, we've structured that just to say, we've, we've tried to structure this grant, putting Highland and Island communities at the center of the fund and hopefully made it more inclusive with sort of on the ground support from, from Lewis and his team. So longer term, what we really hope out of this is that funds like these will create much greater equity between communities, researchers and research organizations. So that's our, that's our bigger vision. And apologies about my internet um, freezing earlier. <laughs> It's a well kept problem in the Highlands Islands, so don't worry, it's all kids. Um, thank you. Um, and, and yeah, and, and I think it's really important that, you know, from science case perspective, it's very exciting to, to help connect. And, you know, no one is an expert in anyone else's life 
Um, so I think I think there's something really important about that, those conversations that can happen from this space. And again, you know, this work can only happen in partnership with different groups. So thank you again to the stakeholders, the people that we're connecting with at the moment, uh, to make sure that we um, are aren't reinventing the wheel. We're making as many, much addition, you know, we're supporting as much as we can connectivity wise. So great. I just to kind of round this bit conversation up. I know it's a short panel, um, but I, I want to bring Joan and, and John Mathieu back on just to kind of share perhaps just a final set of contexts around what people would might want to see uh, in this grant, what they would love to see and how people can get in touch with them. I know they've shared some of the um, details in the chat as well, but John, uh, Joan, do you want to go first? Um, I think what I'd quite like to see is um, sort of really localized solutions um, probably communities who maybe haven't engaged terribly much in climate action before. Um, and I think I'd like to see maybe some projects coming through that are also um, replicable, that we can share that learning with other communities through Highland. Um, that's what we're trying to do with Highland Adapts and we're also working with climate action towns. And I think that there's another area in Highland that's going to be doing a community climate action plan with Keep Scotland Beautiful. So it's really about connecting all of those things together so that we've we, we've got learning and engagement with other communities and how we can learn from each other. Thanks, Sharon. Yeah, if we can have even a little bit of extra learning there, that, that we, we want to be as generous as we can with that. John Mathieu. Yes, uh, we in August, we, we created a survey, <clears throat> uh, surveying our number around a number of items, but we wanted to know mainly what was the kind of baseline diversity of our membership and also what was the needs uh, for uh, further training and uh, and capacity building. And so we found that, of course, we compose mostly of charities and community groups. Um, but I think uh, uh, we, it'd be great for, for this grant to be used by a number of, of uh, bodies and, and, and groups. Uh, number two, they, they also in the survey expressed a need for more training around communicating climate change, um, uh, behavior change, uh, community engagement, and the fourth one was uh, working with the lo local authority to develop uh, or to work on the climate emergency plan. So if any of those aspects, if any of uh, if the grants could be used to, to kind of talk about any of those aspects, particularly I would say kind of behavior change, which has been big on the Scottish government agenda, even though we're kind of perhaps moving away from that, um, uh, I mean, slightly moving away from that focus with the end of the Climate Challenge Fund. But um, um, yeah, those, those two aspects, communicating climate change, echoing what Joanne said, with a number of, of, uh, of people who are, you know, maybe not all interested in the topic of climate change. I think mm -hmm. that'd, be, that'd be very useful. Um, yeah, having, having that diversity of, of approaches and audiences. Thanks, John Matter. And definitely, I think there's something about sparking conversations and, 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 and making sure that it reaches beyond the converted, I think, is, is a real interest to us as well. Um, Kate, just to come to you. Yes. Um, I think I'm really excited to hear the climate change projects that are really happening in the Highlands and Islands on local issues. Um, I think, uh, you know, as was just talked about, and I think the shared learning between groups and researchers, I think is a real opportunity. And also from this, you know, the, the new networks we might be able to create or linking up existing networks, I think is really powerful because I think I've seen a few questions already in the Padlet about, you know, what networks are out there. Um, and then also, I just wanted to mention if people want to find out a bit more about our work, we can put a couple of links in the chat to our community engagement work. But yeah, I think the real thing is about hearing about what are the local climate change issues that people really want to address. So. Thanks, Kate. And um, Steve. Yeah, I think there's a there's a really exciting opportunity here. I think, um, you know, there's there's lots of knowledge and expertise and experience within the Highlands and Islands themselves, within the communities. And I think it's going to be really interesting to see that come to the fore um, and looking forward to seeing what what are the issues, you know, what's important to the people in those regions and, you know, what kind of concerns they have about how climate change might affect them and where they live um, and what actions and fresh solutions to these challenges they might come up with. So, um, 
yeah, it's, it's going to be great to see how those relationships between the communities and researchers and innovators locally kind of emerge and, and grow and develop. So uh, looking forward to seeing what projects come out of it. Brilliant. All right. Well, thank you so much um, for our speakers, John, Mr. Joan, Steve and Kate. Um, for joining us for this panel, you're very welcome to stay. If there's any questions uh, for them, please do feed them into the chat or Padlet and we will pass them on as well. Um, but yeah, thank you, Modern Tang. Um, and that brings us to our next section, um, which is going into a wee bit more detail about what's actually in the grant itself in terms of the application and trying to highlight uh, and I suppose not give, necessarily give tips, but I suppose give guidance about what we're looking for and picking up some of those themes around you, what, what activities do we want uh, communities and researchers to work together on. So um, as Lewis was saying, we're just going to go into a bit more detail now. Um, all of the things that we're going to be discussing are in the guidance documents, which are available online. Um, and one other thing to note as we go through that um, on the application form and in the guidance document, we note the word count maximum for each uh, field. But please be aware that these are maximums and we don't necessarily want you to, to fill up the space with, all, you know, with that maximum. Um, just please take as long as you need to answer the questions. Okay, so let's look at an overall timeline of the grant. Today, obviously we're at the, the webinar. <laughs> so the uh, next important um, date is the deadline for the grant application. So as we mentioned earlier, that's the 30, 31st of January at 5 p.m. Now following that in mid-February, uh, applicants will be uh, confirmed as to whether or not they're, oops. Okay, um, so in mid-February they'll, um, hear confirmation as to whether or not they've been successful. And then in March, we'll be working with community groups. Um, if they require a researcher to be matched, we'll be hosting some um, matching workshops to help facilitate that process. And then in April, projects will start. So the 6th of April, we'll be hosting a launching workshop. And then through April and October is when projects will be happening. In June, we'll hold a community of practice workshop. And in October, there will be a project celebration and evaluation meeting. Okay, so we're going to spend just a little bit of time um, looking at the actual application form just to make sure um, everybody's comfortable with it. And I think this will address, hopefully um, answer some of the questions that we're seeing coming up. So the first things that we're going to ask you about are you and your organization. So we welcome applications from any type of community group and organization, as we've said earlier. Um, we'll ask what groups or what audiences you work with um, and how you plan to involve them. So what you don't necessarily need to be a constituted group. So this is a question that comes up quite a bit. Um, you don't need to be a formal group, but you will need to evidence that your project involves um, the wider community and not just an individual. So we've heard a few times that um, the idea that we want this bottom up versus a top down project. And projects will also have to, projects, We'll have to pick which main council area you're working in, yes. So we're going to, um, you'll select the area. So you, um, if your project or your activities span multiple areas in the Highlands and Islands, we'll ask you to just select the one in which most of the activity will be happening. Okay, then your project idea. So we'll ask you, obviously, what your project idea might be. Um, what theme around climate change are you hoping to explore? Who are you hoping to work with? How does this respond to a wider local need and what kinds of activities might you do? Now, we know that these ideas might change as a project develops, so we just want you to give us an overall idea of how you might organize your project. So some things that we're looking for are ideas of the process, um, milestones that you hope to achieve. For example, if there are going to be any workshops or events, we'd like you to highlight those, um, as well as um, potential changes and outputs that you'd like to see as a result of the project. Okay, and then um, a really key part of the application form is, is telling us about the community that you're going to be working with. So these questions explore how the wider community is gonna be involved and who they are. So we really want you to be as specific as you can. Um, you know, what defines this community? Are they defined based on shared experience, shared characteristics, interests, or needs? Um, are they already motivated around the topic um, or are these people who aren't yet engaged? Now, I want you to also 
to consider, please, if there are any access requirements to support the groups that you're proposing to involve um, and how you might minimize these. So, for example, providing funding for time access needs, such as um, childcare and translation. Finally, we just want to highlight this question that we do ask um, how many participants you um, envision uh, participating in your project. And we just want to highlight that, you know, we says there it's, and it's an approximate number and it is meant to be an approximate number. Um, we also don't necessarily, you know, have an expectation for this to be, we've put the example as a thousand. That's not, <laughs> that's not to say that that's the standard. You know, we very much appreciate that there needs to be a balance between the depth of the impact and the breadth of reach. So what might success look like to you? Um, we've got one field here, it's just 200 words max, um, just a chance for you to tell us, um, you know, what you hope your project might achieve. And hopefully this is a chance for you to tell us what's motivating you to apply. So um, the answer here can be both in terms of outputs and outcomes, so what the project might produce and change. We're also interested, however, in the learning that will be accomplished through the process, both for community groups and the researchers. And we just want to say that evaluation and sharing of learnings will be supported by us um, as you go along through the project. And this will be done through the three community of practice uh, sessions that we've highlighted. Um, however, if there's any specific way that you would find useful to capture some of your learnings and evaluate your project yourself, this is a, a spot on the application form where you can highlight that. Okay, so a key part of the form is going to be this activity timeline. Um, this is a chance for you to give us the basic shape, if you'd like, of the project. So highlighting the key milestones that might be involved. Um, again, just to say, please don't worry about precise dates. Um, this is just meant to be an, an, an outline, an estimate. Um, if you're not sure about specific dates, you can just use the first of the month. So the form does require you to select a specific date. So if you don't have a specific date, just feel free to select the first of that specific month. Um, similarly, if it's um, an event within your project that spans only one day and not a, a multiple days, you can just select that same date for the thrum and two box. Um, again, we, we recognize that this is likely to change as your project develops um, and as you make plans with researchers. And then finally, um, actually not finally, there's another slide after this, <laughs> but we're getting there. Um, Contingency, yes, so COVID is uh, definitely still here with us, unfortunately. Um, so we have a chance on the application form for you to, to think about how your plans might change if local restrictions change in your area. Um, you know, we will support you if this does happen, um, but here in the form is a chance for you to um, think about what options might be available um, and what you might do. So for example, you might have researchers who are working remotely rather than visiting in person. Um, of course, we want to emphasize that grants will be required to follow local government guidelines on social distancing, and um, you're welcome to build in the contingency plans into your budget. Speaking of budget, <laughs> so here's where you're going to outline for us um, your proposed budget for your project. Um, you can add details organized based on items or categories, so you can see an example there um, the level of detail, you know, we don't need individual items, um, but something like materials and equipment would be one budget item. Um, we also know that this is going to probably change when you finalize the project with your community members and research, so sharing approximate breakdowns is fine, though, you know, where possible, please be as specific as you can. So, for example, material specific for the project, contributions for staff time. If you'd like to add more context, um, there's also an additional box and to highlight that in-kind support, so other funding or things that might not already be covered aren't necessary for the process, for the project. Um, so what is eligible uh, to be claimed within your budget? So quite a few things. So um, project specific staff costs, researcher costs, um, as well as materials and equipment essential for the project and travel and substance costs. Now we hope um, we'd like these materials and travel to please be as you know, sustainable as possible. Um, you can also claim for room hire and catering, publicity, speakers and trainers, um, reasonable volunteer expenses, and um, sorry, just the chat's popped up, but there we go, <laughs> as well as 
overheads for the community group. Um, so just to highlight that only 10% uh, of the total budget can be accounted for by overheads for the group. That is something that can be included in your budget, um, as well as these aren't necessarily um, exclusive, so other project related costs and contingencies. Now just to flag a few things that cannot be included in your budget. So cost incurred before your proposed project starts, um, single use disposable items, activities and partnerships outside the UK, emergency top up or maintenance funding, loans, investments or capital costs, and delivery of frontline services. Great, thank you very much, um, Christina. And hopefully that goes through the, pretty much all the questions on the application form. Of course, there's more information on the guidance, but just to give you a feel of, of what we're asking for, and hopefully that all makes sense. And again, if you've got any questions, you can add that onto the Padlet. Um, there was a question coming up just about what the role of the researcher is. And of course, that's an integral part of this grant. This is why it's a little bit different from a, um, a, a kind of a, just a, cli a community climate action project uh, or a, a, a climate change research project as well. It's something in the middle. And so we're going to unpick that a little bit uh, as we go further ahead. How can research and communities work with researchers and how do we envision that to happen uh, for these projects? So the one question that um, Christina just missed um, was looking at, uh, you will be asked specifically on the form, um, how you might work with the research on your proposed project. So for some of you, this may be an opportunity to build on a relationship with uh, uh, that you already have a, with a researcher, in which case, it, or you've got a researcher in mind, and you, you, of course, are very welcome to partner with them in advance of the deadline, in which case you can say yes, and you can tell us a little bit about how you intend to work together. Um, and, and again, we'll unpick how that, what that might look like in the next slide. If you are interested in the, in the project, you're interested in the idea of working with a researcher, uh, you've got a few ideas about how that might look like, uh, then you can, um, you, you can still apply. Uh, the matching could happen afterwards if you are successful, uh, as judged by the independent panel. Um, and what we'll ask you in the application form is just to, to tell us what you, how you might work with a researcher, uh, what kind of researcher might be interesting, what kind of skills, what kind of expertise, what types of things might you want to do, uh, and why that might be helpful. And throughout that, it's not just about how they can help you, but actually how, what could they learn from your community through the process. Just to lean into that a little bit more, um, I suppose this fund in particular is about communities and researchers working together in this kind of middle way. So like I said beforehand, you have on one side, if you imagine kind of community-led climate action, uh, on the other end, you've got climate change research and academic research perhaps, um, what we're looking at is that intersection between these two things, the little, that sweet spot in the middle uh, where communities and researchers work together. It isn't climate research um, necessarily, but it's about building relationships, um, learning from each other, building skills, and for both groups to, to, to be benefiting in both directions. So like we did before, maybe we can be a bit clearer by just talking about a little bit about that dynamic that we're looking for, about what we're unlikely to fund. So the first thing that we're unlikely to fund are if the researchers that are involved or what you're proposing are involved on a kind of one-off basis or on a, on a consultation basis uh, on a one-off kind of single intervention, as it were. So whilst we appreciate they are small grants, we would like to see how community and researchers get to know each other and be involved throughout this the, as the project uh, through all the processes that are involved, the planning and the implementation, maybe thinking about the evaluation, what does success look like? Uh, we want the research to be involved in both of those things. And again, for, for groups that, that we will help match once um, the process in, in March, once people, our groups have been successful or not, um, there will be, please do build in time for these conversations where we will potentially find different researchers, different op uh, options, as it were, uh, to work out what feels like a good fit, what's a good project that could work together. And of course, there may be some adjustments about how you deliver the project, um, what needs to be funded and um, the kind of milestones and timings of the project once yeah, th this is in place as well. We're probably also likely to, unfund, to fund um, res if researchers are the sole lead or conversely, if they're only superficially involved. So again, maybe reiterating that kind of one-off, just um, tokenistic involvement of a researcher. So it should be a collaborative project. 
Um, we do want there to be a lead from the community groups in terms of the topics, the themes, expertise, while still meaningfully involving the researcher. And we'd like to see these grants spark dialogue uh, and conversations with the wider community as well as the researcher as well. And then finally, in terms of the researcher engagement, we're unlikely to fund uh, projects which where the researcher is, is only being brought in to research or conduct a survey or an evaluation on a community. So again, reiterating the same point, point, this isn't research funding. We'd like to see these projects where, uh, where the knowledge and skill exchange is in both directions. So these types of projects are working with or by a community. And I'll pick up a bit more about what we mean by some of these examples. So that's what we're unlikely to fund. So what would we be excited to see? How could researchers work with communities in the projects uh, for this actual grant? So the first one is researchers could work with communities to support knowledge exchange. So that links back to what John Mathieu was talking about, what the results of the survey from SCAN about how to communicate climate change, for example, or how to share knowledge around uh, climate change. So an example of this could be hosting a series of conversation events between the community and researcher. Um, this could be exploring, responding to local questions around climate change, understanding where there is evidence so far in research, but also identifying where there may be gaps, and there are plenty of gaps, uh, giving meaningful opportunities to share back the community's perspective to then shape how the researcher may approach these questions in the future. And we'd love to see projects where, for example, maybe the researcher shares um, a little bit of the landscape, what's happening, and, and, and helping be more and more community-led as the project develops, in particular being shaped by the questions that the communities develop from these conversations. The researcher could work with communities to support action, of course. Um, so this could be developing um, resources, activities, creative responses that address a climate change topic, a question or a challenge in a way that's collaborative. So again, it's around enabling groups and researchers to share the outputs of conversations that you might had uh, more widely to community groups, to stakeholders to advocate uh, for this type of um, the action that you've proposed or the conversations that you've had. Uh, to set the scene for what next, if appropriate. And again, you know, these are small grants, but we hope these are opportunities to try something a little bit different, to build relationships, and hopefully a good stepping stone to more bigger research funding or bigger community project. So examples of this could be things like working with local artists to develop some creative responses. It could be developing podcasts or videos, educational resources as a result of these conversations. And then finally, researchers could work with communities to support skills exchange. So example of this could be researchers supporting communities to themselves be able to explore a question or take action on a specific need or topic. So this could be sharing different skills from the academic world or otherwise. Uh, it could be from social sciences. It could be different arts-based approaches. It could be research, um, different techniques or different frameworks. So participatory action research or citizen science, for example, that communities can take on themselves, which then supports longer term capacity to be able to explore the questions that are meaningful to them to process, synthesize or map some of this local knowledge, the no local voices, and being able to understand and know how you would take this further through more formal research, perhaps, or through consultation or other next steps as well. All right, thank you so much for joining us, everybody. Um, and really looking forward to this conversation. And um, I think, I suppose the, the first thing I'll ask everyone to do is to give a, maybe a brief introduction uh, of yourselves and maybe tell us in your experience, what does a good community researcher partnership look like um, to you? So if we can start with Lindsay from the Scotland of the Bread and tell us a little bit about what you do as well. Hi there, everyone. Um, so yeah, as Lewis has said, I, I work with Scotland the Bread, which is a collaborative project um, focused on growing better grains and baking better bread with the, the common purposes of nourishment, sustainability, particularly, and food sovereignty as well. So we've, um, our work in general, we've researched more nutritious and more diverse grains, which are more suited to the Scottish climate and to growing in agroecological conditions. And we're growing these in the East Nuke of Fife and we're milling them as well and selling them to, uh, to professional bakers and home bakers alike as well. In addition to that, we run two community projects, community engagement projects called Flower to the People and the other is Soil to Slice. 
And these are designed to create opportunities for everyone to get involved in this movement towards a better bread system and um, by learning to, to grow, to process and bake with these grains as well. Um, so it's just a bit of a background about us. And um, our sort of research experience, we've worked with various researchers involved in areas such as crop uh, science and plant breeding. And most recently, we're working with a team at the University of Edinburgh to develop a new metric of agricultural output. So um, that we moving away from yield per hectare and looking at the number of people, uh, jobs and species that are nourished per hectare as well. Um, and I'll speak maybe a little bit more later about our soil to slice project, which involves an element of citizen science in it as well. Um, from, from my experience, I guess, with uh, the work that we've done with these researchers, I think a good community research partnership is one in which both parties have the time or take the time to understand each other's context and um, their expectations as well, what knowledge everyone has and, and their capacity, I think, which is an, an really important part. And building relationships in these ways can give uh, can give the community a better chance of shaping the research and it will bring a bit more depth to the final result. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Lindsay. And I have to say, cracking names. <laughs> fun of, <laughs> um, fun, <of> yeah. <laughs> yeah, brilliant. Um, thanks so much, Lindsay. And we're going to pick up a little bit more. And I know you've got community partners all across, um, of course, Scotland, even though you're based in Fife, but including uh, on in the Highlands and Islands as well. So we'll pick up a bit more about that, I'm sure, a little bit later. How about yourself, uh, Fiona Henderson? Hello, hi everyone. Sorry, I've missed everything up till now, so I'm in the deep end a bit, and I hope I don't repeat lots of things that have already been said. You know you're having a bad Monday when you write down your introduction and start with, hi, my name is Fiona Henderson. And I, <laughs> okay, so things aren't going well today. It is Monday after all. But anyway, so my work largely focuses on social innovation, um, which essentially is about how we as a society create new ways of doing things to disrupt the status quo and is very relevant to climate change. So I do a lot of work with social enterprise. Um, I'm particularly interested in social care and caring for vulnerable people in the climate emergency and as we move forward with climate change. Um, so a lot of that is about climate justice and climate injustice, of course. Um, at the moment, I'm working for for uh, well with the Centre for Expertise in Waters, uh, who are funded by the Scottish Government on a project around flood risk communication. So I'm working with SEPA and Scottish Water and people with like, like that on that one. Um, but to me, a good community researcher partnership is all about what Lindsay's been saying about that uh, mutual connection and also about the benefits, uh, not just for the researcher. If a researcher comes along, you know they're getting something out of it. It's about what the community then gets out of it as well. And for me, I like it to be quite pragmatic. So I think there should be a practical outcome from research that's um, done with, by and for communities. Um, otherwise, there's no point if it just sits in an academic journal, what's the point of that? So it could be to influence policy or it could be to create a new way of working or to create a new initiative or action or just to evaluate the impact of that to try to generate more funding for that. But I think communities should expect uh, a, a practical outcome and should demand that. And I think it's quite important that we as researchers traditionally do have quite a bad reputation of coming in and taking and then disappearing into our little, what they used to call ivory towers and not giving a lot back. And I think those days are gone now. And so this is a very exciting funding opportunity where you're in control and you get to do the demands very explicitly and you, the power dynamic flips. And I, I really like that. And I think that there should be some fantastic things come out of this. Um, although it'll feel a bit scary at the beginning for everybody. <laughs> so Thanks sorry, so run over. <laughs> No, no, it's great. It's great. Um, no, absolutely. Um, I think you've captured all the things that we're trying to, to, to kind of navigate in these types of partnerships. Thank you, Fiona. Um, and then we go to Peter. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Lewis. Um, yes, so my name's Peter. I'm uh, geographically about as far away as you can get without leaving the UK. I'm down in, in Cornwall. Um, I work for the University of Exeter, um, but I've got a couple of, of hats here. One, uh, with that organisation. So I run something called the Green Futures Network, which is a, a new initiative that's going to be launching next year, which is aiming to uh, increase access to the climate and environmental research that the university develops. Uh, we talk a lot about being uh, at the 
the forefront of climate research and being an innovator and using lots of words like that that sound very good but don't really mean very much in practice uh, and so part of my role is to okay take some of this research that we're talking about and support communities and businesses and local councils to understand how that is useful for what they're doing on the ground day to day the other hat I've got here is as the co-chair of the Transition Network, which is an international movement of grassroots organisations. We work very closely with, uh, with SCAN, uh, who we've already heard from. Uh, and so with those perspectives, um, I think um, my response to this kind of initial question around uh, you know, how community research partnerships can, can work very much echoes what Fiona was saying around, around power. Uh, I think from an organisational institutional perspective, uh, there's often times when universities and other institutions can see the community as an asset, as something that they can kind of reach out to and take and use and, and there you go, job done. Uh, and I've certainly experienced that from transition as well, you know, seeing, oh, we've got this network, we've got this grassroots experience, and that can, can be a value to, to universities. And what I've really seen working um, in a much better dynamic more recently is, is communities having the confidence to, to really understand what they can bring to a partnership. So rather than um, either uh, it being put on them or passively taking on the role of, a, a, of an asset or as, uh, someone that can give uh, perspective and give experience, communities really understanding how that can be a really a, an equal relationship with an equal power dynamic uh, and recognizing that um, I think is, is, a, is a really important part of any uh, of any partnership. And I think certainly from an institutional perspective, that's getting better and better. Uh, and, and projects like this, I think, are really going to help. Thanks so much, Peter. Um, a really interesting kind of framing there as well in terms of assets. And again, that trying to do change some of those power dynamics. And, and, you know, again, these are small grants, but, you know, it's so rare for even relationship building to be supported in, in this way, in a way that goes directly to community groups. And I hope, you know, in a small, modest way, that that's the learning that we're really fascinated by through this process, as much as, of course, that we are passionate about these, the climate action that communities can, can, can make. Um, yeah, it's, it's, sadly, we're not gonna have Fiona um, be able to join us from the Golston State Trust, but I, I guess one of the things we kind of wanted to highlight uh, from some of the work that they're doing. I'm not going to paraphrase it, but we're going to share maybe some links to the work that they do. But they've had a few different projects, uh, which I think looked at particularly around radical land ownership and working with the local artists uh, to help actually synthesize and, and research um, in, a, in a kind of creative way how to approach um, understanding of land and actually using uh, developing sculptures that were actually built into the earth um, and into stones using QR codes, for example, uh, to actually communicate that a little bit late um, with the rest of the community, which I think hits some of the nail on the head in terms of things of being community led and, and exploring different knowledge and then making that knowledge creatively accessible for, for the wider community and sparking conversations. And they also had a great um, set of videos uh, called Andrasta, uh, which is Gallic for right now, um, to explore and look at the, the youth voice around that. And I think that, again, young people led projects is something that I think we we're really excited by. Um, I'm gonna to come to, um, I'm gonna to go to Fiona Henderson actually for this bit um, and pick up a little bit more what you're talking about in terms of, from a researcher's perspective, working around flood risk, you know, why is community voice not just nice to have, but essential? I think I feel like your, your starting remarks have already lent into that, but could you tell us a bit more and how that's applied to your work, perhaps particularly on the Western Isles? Yeah, well, in a lot of different ways, actually, but the, so when you think about um, flood risk communication, you look at sort of flood line and, and the SEPA communications that come out to you, which can be very statistic. Some of them are quite scientific. You've got things like return periods, which are quite complex. And you've got a reliance on things like Twitter and, and things like that, that, that kind of, if you're not engaged with those social media things, and I'm terrible, I'm not engaged with any of it, but um, you, you just miss them. You're, you, you, you know, a lot of people are turning off flood line and things like that because they get so many alerts and things like that. So there is a big problem around communicating flood risk and it's going to increase because obviously climate is changing and we're going to have more areas hit by flooding. So we were asked to kind of look into that. So the first thing that happened as soon as you peeled off that lid and had a little look about the, the public 
as they called them, was, wait a minute, these are very, very different groups of people. You can't compare somebody that's been flooded in Elgin with somebody on use that's, you know, got their, their croft eroding and they're moving the fences back every year. You know, you need to be talking in different ways to different people about different types of flood risk. And then when we looked a little bit deeper, um, we kind of came across the fact that they don't actually tell you what to do. So they tell you that there's a flood risk, but then, oops, we're not telling you how to react. We might tell you to pack a wee bag and take it with you when you leave and things like that, but we're not telling you a lot about um, flood protection measures and things like that because they all cost money. Um, and there's a lot you can do locally to not only uh, manage your flood risk, but also to predict your own flood risks in the area and to forecast your own flood risks in the area. So the deeper we looked, the more local it became. We did a big literature review. We pulled out over 3,000 papers, whittled that down to about 350 and went through all of those. And almost to a single paper, it said communities have to be in charge of communicating flood risk. They have to communicate their own flood risk to each other. People listen to their neighbours. They listen to their friends. They don't listen to the government so much. They don't trust the government so much. There was a huge amount once we started to pull back the layers but everything just became more and more localized. And so for us, as we move into this climate um, change that we're going to see with the increasing rainfall, with the sea level rises, with this more precarious position we're in, it's really important that communities are the leading voice for their areas. Um, I've done work across Scotland in different uh, flood risk areas and, Every single place I've gone, there's been experts on predicting the flood locally that know what things to use. They'll use SEPA tools, sure, like river levels and things like that, but they know how to combine them with weather forecasts. So, for example, um, and, and you see it elsewhere as well, um, but for example, in the Spey, they know two or three days ahead that their property is at risk of flooding, but they can't prevent it because landowners have built banks up further up the river to protect farmland, things like that. There's a whole system solution needed, but the communities are at the heart of that. And for me, where research helps is to amplify, amplify those voices, but also to de demand policies change based on very strong evidence based on these policy briefings and the writings that we can do as researchers, that's our job. We are the tools of the communities and we are also part of our community where we live. So we all have different expertise, the farmers, the researchers, you know, the shopkeepers, we all have different expertise. Our job is to shout and to shout in a way that the politicians and the policy experts hear. Um, so, Peeling back just the flood risk thing, it, it was just really apparent. Climate action has to be with communities, by communities, for communities, and it has to be supported by resources pouring in. And to me, what's exciting about this is if you can get a little bit of money out, you can leverage more out. So if you can start something using this tiny pot of money, you can spread it out bigger. And you just need to be, use your community smarts, use your researcher, and then you can leverage all that. Sorry, Lewis. Okay. No, not at all. That's, that's great, you know, um, and really, really important. You know, I think we very much see that some of, the, some of these projects might be starting points and we want to see what happens next. And I think that's where we yeah. can connect in and, and partner as much as we can, um, because there are, you know, th there are opportunities there. And it, sometimes it's about speaking different languages and understanding the different lay of the land, as it were, metaphorically and otherwise. Um, I want to bring Lindsay in at this point, um, because Lindsay, Scotland Red has been taking kind of quite a unique approach in many ways um, to looking at how communities can explore some of these topics by themselves with support of researchers, but taking that system science approach around flower growing and, and wheat. Could you tell us a wee bit more about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so as I mentioned before, our soil to slice project involves providing community growers, um, you know, allotments and um, veg plots that a lot of community groups have with some of our grains, um, as well as to support the access to small scale equipment for processing um, and a forum for, for peer learning so that they can engage local people in growing, threshing, milling and baking with locally, these locally grown grains. Um, so we're currently partnered with about almost 20 groups across the country. Um, for, uh, who are they're sowing these pots of wheat and in really in unusual and, and really different spaces that can be from um, you know raised beds in a couple of primary schools 
um, or the middle of building sites. There's one in Edinburgh that's doing it in there. And there's one in Edinburgh as well that's growing in a sort of grassy patch at the corner of an inner city estate um, and others in sort of local gardens or in a friendly farmer's field as well. So it's really quite varied spaces that they're doing it in. Um, and they're finding that this project can really help to change kind of mindsets around growing spaces, uh, particularly uh, to get a new perspective on where they live and building a sense of community through baking together or learning about traditional sort of stories, songs and celebrations that are associated with green harvests. Um, and ultimately, we, we hope that this is going to inspire communities to work towards uh, relocalizing a, a bread supply and really thinking about where they're getting their daily loaf from. Um, so as well as as doing all that and helping communities in this way. We're also aiming to support their participation in citizen science, as you say, um, and we're doing that by providing a data log and a bit of guidance on recording information about their crop. It's, it's quite sort of simple information, hopefully quite easy for everyone to, to take part in, and that's sort of things like measuring the height of the plant um, throughout the growing season and you know weighing its final yield and thinking about its, its baking quality once they manage to make some bread with that. Um, and this means that if they continue to grow grains in successive years, which many of them are doing, they'll be able to track their experiences year on year and um, consider how their local environment and the weather conditions they've experienced that year um, can create different results for their for their harvest. And what we're quite excited about is that, um, you know, any data that they collect um, from these very varied plots and very varied parts of the country will really contribute to, and, and we love that involvement that they're able to give, um, bring that kind of democratic aspect to our own wider research, which I mentioned before, and into you know growing better grains and these ones that are more adaptable to the Scottish climate. Um, another uh, similar but connected part to it is that communities have the opportunity to get involved in the sort of final seed selection process through these people's plant breeding events that we like to organize every year. Um, it's been difficult to do over the past couple of years because of COVID, uh, but essentially it's about bringing everyone together, you know, from very different backgrounds and different sort of knowledge levels. You know, there will be scientists in there, but it's also citizens and these communities that are participated in the project. Um, and they'll all together select the grains that are grown in the following season from our trial plot and also from their own plots um, in their local area. So all those present at the events, you know, they'll, many of them don't have experience of plant breeding, um, but they're invited to choose stems of wheat that they are drawn to for whatever reason that may be. It could be they're very symmetrical, they have a nice color, or they don't look like they have any disease on them. Um, and then usually we'll have a sort of researcher partner there who will guide, guide the selection, explain what different things might mean, different characteristics um, might bring to the plant as well. So our hope is that in, by including this diversity of people in the process, that will contribute to a genetic diversity in the crop and into the plant, um, creating a, a more resilient plot, uh, crop, sorry, which is better able to, to respond to various environmental threats and pests and diseases. Um, and in this way, you know, citizens and communities are playing a really exciting a really direct role in developing wheat crops that are ready to adapt to a changing climate, which is, um, you know, obviously what we're what we're kind of talking about today. Um, so yeah, that's that's really how we're bringing citizen science into the soil to slice uh, project. And I can pop a couple of links into the chat as well, just if anyone wants to learn a bit more about that or about our work in general. That sounds great, Lindsay. Um, I mean, what I love over that is it's a lot of it is about you know, almost, you know, you're building from what the community already have expertise in, you'll have growers, you'll have lots of different skills. And then it, sometimes it is about framing, sometimes it's about language, it's about how do you, you know, it's not to say that people don't know how to measure it, but giving the framework, which then is recognized from an ac academic perspective, and that links to what Fiona was saying, but amplifying and be able to make sense of in a way that sometimes some people will respond to it, it is slightly differently or conceptualizing it differently. Um, that's really, really exciting. Which brings us to, to Peter, um, just perhaps to bring a bit of your insight. I mean, some of this, some of the pro examples so far have been about conversation sparking. Some are literally doing um, some research are, and, and, and citizen science research, perhaps. I guess, what about action, particularly around climate? You know, the world is burning, the climate changes now. Um, how can we reconcile can, and kind of bring communities and researchers to work together towards action as opposed to just discussion? Yeah, great question. This is really important. 
And and I should say, uh, being up at, uh, at COP26 in Glasgow with a lot of academics from the university, really noticing a desire uh, from academics, uh, mild, with, mild with kind of a, a frustration at, uh, at some leadership, a real desire for a lot of academics to want to work with people who are actually doing stuff on the ground and actually taking action. And I think communities re represent that in a really positive way. So I, I definitely think there's, there's more of a trend towards, uh, towards action. Um, in terms of what that might mean uh, in, in practice, I think, um, so one example would be, we do a lot of work on climate modeling uh, at the University of, of Exeter. So, I mean, I'll take the Phoenix example of flooding, uh, but we could also look at uh, heat, uh, at rainfall, but looking at flooding. So uh, at an academic level, we've got lots of data about what the, what the climate is going to look like in five, 10 years, in particular places, you know, really down to, you know, kind of square foot level of detail across the, 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 the UK. Uh, but at an academic level, that, that doesn't tell us any stories about what we should do in practice, about where that action should be or what that should be. And then if you bring it to individuals and ask individuals or sh show them a map, you know, the first thing people do is look at, oh, where's my house? Is my house underwater? Uh, and, and if it is, oh, OK, probably we need to do something. And if it isn't, oh, that's a relief. But what we need to do is to find that point in the middle, which is where communities can come in, which is telling the stories of, OK, okay your house might not be impacted directly, but what about uh, how you get to work or how you get to hospital or where you get your food from? And it's only through working with communities that we can tease out those stories that tell us where the action should be, because the kind of action we need at this level is, is very systemic action. It's not what's the new innovative solution that no one has done before that we need to bring in. And I think there's a real tendency towards that. We get excited by new ideas. But a lot of climate action, we don't need new ideas. We need to implement what we already know, whether it's about the impacts that we want to respond to or the solutions that are already working somewhere else. What we need is to understand the stories of a community to understand how to have a systemic impact. So who is climate change going to affect in your community? You know, what, what kind of demographics of people, what geographic spread of people and in what way? And, and by uh, kind of unlocking that, bringing in data, uh, academic data, combining it with the stories that you already have, the expertise in your own experience that you already have, it can then help identify where those actions can take place. Uh, and, and then I think that helps take a bit of the pressure off to come up with really, uh, you know, powerful and engaging new ideas and actually build actions that you probably already know how to do, but you're framing them in a slightly different way by understanding how you are part of a wider system within your community. And I think that's a really powerful model that's, that's, that's really getting a lot of action at the moment. Yeah, that's really, really interesting, Pisa. And, and I, I remember, yeah, I, I really like the how the systems approach and everyone feeding in and again acknowledging these are small projects but that's how that connectivity the kind of linking to the, these wider networks that exist uh, the hubs that what scan is doing um and how all that can feed into you know bringing in these new different in insights and i think that's if this can be a catalyst for that what next something that bigger like, to try something new sometimes you know these projects might not go anywhere you know people the community groups have learned something, the researchers learned something, that's, that's as far as it goes. Sometimes there isn't that big next step of funding. And again, maybe there's something for us to think about how we then can advocate for that um, moving forward in terms of learning and trying to share that with the networks that do exist. Um, yeah, I mean, we can go on for a while. We're, we're, gonna, keep, we're gonna draw this slowly to a close, I'm afraid. Um, but to maybe just to round off, um, do you have a bit of advice or reflection that you might share to community groups who might be listening here and now or on catch up um, working with research about climate action do you have a last kind of uh, thought uh, to share uh, and we'll go with um, piece of first then reverse order uh, yeah I think just the first thing before engaging with academics before that outreach just taking that moment to step back and look at you know what is it that we know how do we tell our own story to ourselves about what it is that we're doing and who do we reach and just just taking a moment to look at it a little bit differently uh, and think about how the work that you're doing links to other projects in your community or similar projects in other communities. Uh, and I think that might help you understand uh, what it is the value that you can really bring to these relationships. Thanks so much, Peter. Um, Fiona. Yeah, just adding to that, I would I would suggest just having a an honest look around the table and saying who else needs to be in the room if you're going to actually achieve some of this. Um, and 
don't be scared to reach out. People tend to be, even at local authority level, sometimes that can be, people can find that a bit hit or miss, but it's worth a shot. And anything that can focus your ideas and strengthen you, just use it. People are there to serve communities because we're all part of a community. So yeah, reach out. Thanks, Fiona. Um, and just from our previous conversation about social care, I think it's also thinking about who's in the room, who's isolated, who's, you know, I think that's why we want to encourage people to think about those access costs and who isn't in the room as much as those who are, of course. Uh, and then Lindsay, just to finish. Um, yeah, I think, sort of just repeating and, and building on what um, Peter and Fiona have been saying is that, you know, um, those networks are out there, you know, we're certainly love working with these communities across everywhere and everyone's got such different skills and such different knowledge they can bring to the table so I think there can be a lot of um it's very easy to think about barriers to doing a particular activity but maybe that's just a bit of reassurance to say there will tend to be a partner or a network or someone out there who will be able to support it and help you find a solution to that so yeah think outside the box about what sort of activity you want to do because uh, not many people expect to see a a wee patch of wheat on the edge of a street corner so there could be something that really engages people in a very different way to think about how they can respond to climate change or a poem that will capture the imagination clearly uh, but no thank you and i think that's a really good reminder about you know of course there is it is an emergency but at the same time i think the positive and the asset around climate action is it, it's leveraging all this creativity in the communities to find solutions and recognize new skills and and seeing a real positive to that um, am amongst the um, climate anxiety and, and other things i want to say a massive thank you to pisa to lindsay to fiona for joining this um, panel um, if you do have any questions for them um, we'll, we'll share their contacts in the in the chats and then the follow-up email uh, but if you have any questions uh, feel free to put them into the padlet or into the chat as well um, and that kind of brings us to our um, question and answer session. Um, and so I might invite uh, Christina and Kate if they want to join onto the call. And we'll say thank you to Lindsay, Peter and, and Fiona again. Brilliant. Hi, Christina. Uh -huh. Lewis, hey. I think you need to enable the my video <laughs> great thank you <laughs> great so we've been through a few we've been doing our best to answer questions as we've gone through the webinar and there's quite a few there's a few that have been repeating so i'll i'll start christina and then you can jump in if you like <laughs> Um, so one, a couple, there's been um, a few questions about will we match organisations with researchers? This may have came earlier before we did a big discussion about how the work with researchers will um, be supported. But um, and someone asked also, you know, could it be environmental researchers, operational and social researchers too? So yes, in short, don't worry if you don't have a researcher, we, we've allowed some time once projects have been selected after the February, uh, in February, that we would then go back to projects and match you up with a relevant researcher. And that might involve a conversation with a couple of researchers, you know, so it won't be us saying this is what you need. It, it will be a collaborative process where you get to sort of almost have a chat with somebody or a couple of people that we're suggesting. Um, that said, you might have an idea of the kind of support you want. So, um, and if you don't, that's not a massive problem, but I just think, you know, you could, you could, there's a part in the application form which Christina went through earlier, um, where you have a chance to kind of say, if you do have some ideas about how you might like to work with the researcher and that might then change in the research and matching. So um, there was a couple of questions about Highland and Ireland networks involved in climate change. So we will endeavor to share between networks, especially information that we're gathering in the process of putting this grant together. Um, it's, it's not a key purpose of what we're doing, but actually is really important in terms of a legacy. We do recognize that. So I hope that um, answers that question. And we recognize that's part of a wide impact for the grant. Um, and if you do have particular questions, just get in touch with us and we'll do our best if we can to link you up um, where relevant. Um, 
then there's a question around what type of project constitutes a climate change project, which is a very good question. I hope that's been answered a bit through the webinar, but um, in the Q&As, we've put a link to, under the guidance document, there's a section called Projects We Fund. And that gives you a bit of a suggestion through different types of themes um, that Christina went through earlier. But we're not saying you have to work on those themes, but it just gives you a way in if you're not quite sure whether what you're planning is, is quite right or, you know, relevant. And then, I mean, projects obviously can cover adaptation or mitigation. And ultimately, we're interested in local projects that adapt and respond to climate change issues that they matter, most importantly. So it's not about a small group of people saying, oh, this really matters, but maybe not even that relevant to anybody else. And also I think it's about making a positive difference to you and your community. So there's there's those kind of aspects that you might want to consider. I just want to um, add to another oh, question. Can I just add to that, Kate, yeah, real quick? Do. So just to say, if you do want specific feedback, if you've got an idea that you want to discuss, um, some people have been in touch already with myself or with Lewis, we're happy whichever one of us might be most helpful to discuss your specific project ideas with you. So please do get in touch if you need additional clarification. Yeah, thanks, Christina, absolutely. Um, and I think the other key question that came up a lot was about the cost of researchers, whether that's included in the £4,500 grant and how do people estimate those costs? So to start with, if you're not matched with the research or you haven't got someone in mind, we suggest in your budgets, consider researcher expenses such as travel. If you're you know, very remote, it might even include accommodation, COVID permitting, obviously, given the situation we're in at the moment, but we envisage the majority of research cuffs, costs rather would be covered in kind by their university or organization. That said, there might be independent researchers or, you know, another scenario. And in that case, once projects and researchers have been selected to work together, there's an opportunity then to revise the budgets if necessary. So we're not being really strict, but I think the key thing to point out here is that um, it's not that we don't value researchers in our costs. It's just that very often in these sorts of, in research, um, researchers often get money and communities often are not funded to take part for example and that's all the budget is that it should mainly support community costs because we want to enable the communities to lead this this work so they're the ones i've picked out christina did you have any others to add uh, yeah i just wanted to highlight um somebody asked about our uh, schools being community groups um and that's fine but we just want to make sure that um the project that you're envisioning really involves the wider community as well so we're not likely to probably fund something that's just for your school specifically but if the school wants to act as a community group and run a project for the wider community then that would be fine i think obviously you're recognizing that in highland line schools are very often the hub for communities um but not yeah. perhaps a formal um only school project um a formal school project so so in Brilliant. that instance I would suggest people really draw that out in the application, make that quite clear so that, that we understand, you know, so that it's clear within within what you're proposing. Just want to say we've got maybe two minutes, so probably time for one or two more questions. I appreciate everything that's been written so far. So um, if, if there's any other questions that a burning question um, that anyone has. Um, this is probably your time to ask, um, at least live, and obviously you can follow up and we'll share my own details and Christina's and the community's um, email as well. So it isn't the last opportunity, but certainly one with everyone here. Are there any other questions? You can put your hand up um, or you can put it in the chat. No. Well, uh, I'll slowly draw to a close. If you're still typing, that's absolutely grand. I appreciate it. It has been a long webinar. We, we fit a lot in. So um, we have a QR code here, um, which has just the link you would have probably already found that has um, all the connections to the further resources, the application form, um, just to, exp to explain that the expression of, of interest is different from the application form. So if you for filled out the expression of interest, um, obviously uh, there's still the application form to fill out. 
Uh, please do share with groups. You may, it may not be right for you, but there may be other groups that might be interested. And if you're a researcher who's listening to this, welcome. Um, you're very welcome to fill out an expression of interest as well. And, and, and that means that we can um, match you uh, a little bit, you know, down the line potentially and add you to the database of, of researchers who may be connected. If you want to connect with us on social media uh, for updates, um, you can do so. They've got our Twitter, ha Twitter handles there uh, for those socially inclined, uh, socially media inclined. Um, but we also, were, if you've signed, registered for the expression of interest, we'll also be sending updates um, in terms of the recording, for example, uh, and just a reminder about the deadline and things like that. So again, for those of you who may have missed it or you know groups that have missed it, if they register for the expression of interest, then we'll be able to send them those resources as well. Um, and just to clarify, so but Science Cayley and the organization I run um, are supporting on the ground as much as with the community's project as well. So you can either email the community's team or to myself. We will be com having conversations in between uh, with us as well. And there may be a different individual that might be more appropriate. Um, but just to clarify that both of those emails um, are suitable for you if you've got questions and we can always signpost to other uh, people if we need to. And just a reminder that I, the deadline is the 31st of January. I know we're slowly, to, slowly starting to wind down for Christmas uh, and the holidays, um, but hopefully that's plenty of time. If you do have any more questions, just send us a message and we're very happy to, to, um, to answer them. And of course, we wish you good luck in that process. Um, I think there's lots of exciting ideas on this call, a lot of exciting ideas on the Padlet. Um, just a quick question, at the 11th hour there, um, we are funding, up to 10, um, around 10, give or take. It a little bit depends on, on the, the number, um, but just to give you a sense of scale. Um, and that leads us to our thank you. So just a massive thank you, Amoran Tang, Tapa Life, to uh, everyone who joined the, the webinar. Um, so for our first um, panel, we had Joan Laurie, John Matthew Gano, and Dr. Steve Scott. Uh, uh, we had uh, Fiona Rennie, who didn't make it, but was in here perhaps in spirit from Golston State Trust, Lindsay Cochran, uh, for Scotland the Bread and Dr. Fiona Henderson from Glasgow Caledonia University and Peter Lafour from the Green Futures Network and Transitions Network. To our BSL interpreters, Stephen and Mark, thank you. Um, and, and to our uh, captioners as well, thank you. It's not an easy role, um, but very much appreciated. Uh, I want to thank our, our stakeholder group, which we're still formulating at the moment, but for those conversations that we have had and the Royal Society of Edinburgh as well, who are going to be helping um, with the program as well. And of course, I'm not going to read everyone's name, but the team from BSA, from Science Cayley, um, and the rest of our team, and UKRI as well, and the rest of the team that have been involved in, in formulating the, the grants uh, behind the scenes. So a massive thank you to everyone for joining and for your time. Um, and I, I wish you a feskimar, uh, a very good afternoon, and take very good care. And, and we'll be in touch soon. Take care.